Well, so <clears throat> there, there, I'm going to compare um, evidence that, that is favorable to short time, that is a few thousand years since creation, not millions of years, short time and a global flood, and some evidence that's challenging to that view. So when we talk about rocks, we, we have uh, things we don't have answers to. We have some other things that, that we do have more answers. Well, let's see. Did work. Oops. Once in a while it works. OK. The, the difficult evidence the, uh, in terms of geologic time is the radiometric time scale. This is a method you use for dating rocks. It gives dates of many millions of years, or billions of years. And uh, there's some work being done by creationists, but really we don't know how to answer this. So that's something, that's the difficult side of this thing. We don't really know the answers to uh, radiometric dating. So should we get worried? Well, there's a, <clears throat> I'm, I'm talking, and this slide we're talking about why do many scientists believe this geologic time scale? And evidence is part of it. There is evidence, which we don't know uh, how to explain. The other part of this is philosophy, worldview. What's a worldview? Well, about 1990, I needed a new car, a four-wheel drive, and I wondered what to buy. I did some reading, and I'd read about these Ford Explorers. I'd never seen one, but I uh, test drove one and bought it. Once I had it, was driving the road, I saw there are lots of Explorers out there. So why didn't I see them before? Well, with my experience with explorers, a little tiny bit of my worldview changed. Because of experience, I now saw things I didn't see before. And that's what a worldview does. Your worldview is, is the way you see the world, the, how you answer the big questions in life. Um, where do we come from? Why are we here, et cetera? They also, it also influences what you notice in other ways. and so. And that's a, a worldview is a philosophy. And the, the worldview, our philosophy, has a great influence in science. Um, the worldview for most scientists is methodological naturalism, which means there's no creator, there may be no miracles. You have to explain everything by the laws of chemistry and physics. Okay, and so the naturalistic worldview requires millions of years. And this is a part of science that many people don't understand, including the scientists and including many Christians. The, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the worldview is, is controls how we think. So the question I asked before, is, is there, let's go back there, I, I missed something here. Um, is there a, a another, some other lines of evidence? Well, yes there is, but to, we have to understand this worldview, this philosophy. If you accept naturalism, then you take the evidence, you put that together with your worldview, and that brings you to a conclusion. And in this worldview, all evidence will be interpreted uh, according to the naturalist worldview, uh, which assumes long ages. Okay. And many Christians do not understand the dominating role of naturalism in science. I like to say it's, it's just generally not really appreciated how much of a role this has in science. We think of science as being these the objective people. Uh, they just go by the data. It leads them to conclusion. No, especially when you're talking about origins. If you're doing chemistry experiments, that's something else. Uh, but if you're talking about ancient history, where we came from, what's happened in the past, the philosophy has a dominating uh, role. In fact, I would say, it, put it this way, in the study of origins, assumptions rule in science. Your assumption of naturalism rules. You, you cannot go against it if you're going to be considered a scientist. You have to interpret everything you see <coughs> according to the worldview of naturalism. Okay, so <coughs> if... Uh, is there other evidence? Well, yes, there is. And uh, my, my question here is, if you, if you take the naturalistic worldview and you set it aside, you put it aside and you think about it in a more open view, does the evidence, does the geological evidence really indicate long ages? And that's what I'm going to talk about here. <coughs> so.
so much evidence actually is not compatible with long ages of time. Um, and this is not appreciated because for many scientists, you can't even ask this question whether it's compatible. You have to interpret it according to millions of years. But let's look at that evidence that is actually a problem for the naturalistic point of view, a problem for the millions of years. <coughs> okay, each, each worldview makes predictions of what research will discover. And from our biblical worldview, we can make predictions of what we will find. And then we can go out and do the research. And the biblical prediction is that accumulating evidence will favor a short time and or catastrophic processes. You know, we believe in the a global flood that wasn't that long ago. And we predict that more research you do, the more it will, the evidence will favor that point of view. Whereas the naturalistic worldview predicts that, well, everything we find will, will favor uh, long ages. So each point of view makes different predictions. And <coughs> um, our, our, our worldview predicts that we'll find evidence that says it hasn't been that long and it's ago and it's been very catastrophic. And the evidence already does. A biblical worldview predicts more to come as we continue to do research. So um, now does this idea work? I say we can do this, does it work? Yes, and I'll show you reasons to say yes. <coughs> but now this doesn't want to work. Okay, here we go. So let's look at the good news. <coughs> Evidence that supports a biblical worldview. Now this morning in church, I, I said I was gonna Explain, to, uh, explain why this little fossil here is not compatible with the geological time scale. And um, even with the lights on, you couldn't really see what this is. But it's actually uh, what's called a coprolite. Now, what is coprolite? Coprolite is fossilized dung. Okay, this is probably a little bit of crocodile poop. Okay, and it's beautifully preserved. <coughs> and uh, so how, why is this so well preserved? Well, the problem here is that it's in a, a very finely laminated rock. Um, very thin laminations, and most geologists think these laminations were sediment that accumulated one lamination per year, or at most, a few laminations each year. Okay, I looked at this under a microscope and it has 180 laminations. Okay, so what's the chance that this crocodile dung lay there on the, this lake bottom for 100 years? and is beautifully preserved. There's zero probability. It just, it, it cannot happen. And this is just one fossil out of millions in this particular formation up in, in Wyoming, <coughs> the Green River Formation. And so something is wrong with that time scale. So let's look at more of this. <coughs> so just to summarize some things quickly on this slide, some, some things that go against the long ages time scale are archaeology, growing support for biblical accuracy. In biology, we're going to talk about this in the second half of this talk here. Darwinian theory is collapsing. And now we're going to talk right now about geology, growing evidence that doesn't fit the long time scale. So let's look at that evidence that doesn't fit the time scale. Now, just to summarize these two worldviews, we call it convention. Sometimes we talk about conventional geology. That means conventional science, the science as most people believe it. Uh, that is not uh, not creationist. So the conventional theory: you have ancient events must be explained by processes seen or feasible in the modern world. So all these rock layers, according to this theory had to have been produced by the kind of process you can see today in the modern world. How rivers deposit sediments and other processes do. <coughs> the biblical worldview, ancient events were probably quite different. You had a geological catastrophe, uh, which Noah wrote out in his boat. Unfortunately, Noah wasn't keeping notes, so we have to try to figure it out. <coughs> um, so what are some some things that don't fit that long ages and don't fit the idea that the processes we see happening today are what produce the, the geologic record. 
Well, we have geo ge geological formations that are very, very widespread. <coughs> For instance, here you have, notice this map. This is the Canadian border. Canada is right down here. This is one rock formation that goes from Canada almost to Mexico, over uh, one, two, three, four, five, about a half a dozen states. Here are examples of it. It's a very colorful, uh, beautiful formation. And you, uh, so how do you spread a layer of mud and sand over um, several hundred thousand square miles? Well, if you tried to do that today, what would happen? You got the landscape today has, uh, it's a collage of uh, hills and valleys and river beds and all kinds of things. You couldn't spread a, a uniform layer over that area. It just wouldn't work. So how did this happen? takes very different conditions than what we have today. <clears throat> and that's just one example. Um, here's the Shinner conglomerate. That's a, a layer about 50 feet thick, spread over 150,000 square miles. Uh, here's another one that the Chin Lee group over a huge area. And so how do you do that? Well, you can't do it on the world as it is now. Modern processes don't begin to e explain how you could spread uh, mud and sand and other materials over such a huge area. Well, let's talk about that a little more. What are we? What processes are we talking about? Okay, here are some modern processes that produce that lay down sediment, uh, rivers, streams. Uh, in a lake, you can have things accumulating that brought in by by rivers, by streams. Uh, those are some of the modern processes. Also, sediment is accumulating right offshore on the in the ocean. So. Will those processes work to spread these huge layers of, of sediment over such huge areas like I showed you? Well, okay, what, are the, what am I talking about when I talk about these widespread rock layers? Okay, look at the top picture. <clears throat> this is up in Utah. This is a, that's about a thousand foot high cliff there. And this, the locals call this 50 mile mountain because that cliff goes for 50 miles. And you look at these layers of, of sandstone. They're just continuous, and they go the whole 50 miles. And, and they're, they're flat, even layers. How, how could streams and rivers produce that? Just doesn't work. And here you are in uh, uh, called Canyonlands in Utah. Again, you look at these rock layers. They're just continuous, and they go right on past all the way over here. And it's not only this. They continue for 100 or 200 miles. This is the Grand Canyon, and you see these layers right here, and they continue right over here. The same rock layers. There's one that I've done research on, which is right up here near the top. It continues uh, all the way across, and it goes for, again, 200 miles. <coughs> Nothing like that happens today. Some more examples. There's a, <coughs> there's a, a, uh, a structure here in southern Utah we call the Grand Staircase because it's a, like a stairway, but it's, it's 100 miles long from, from the bottom to the top. Um, and so here you are at the bottom of it. We're looking at it from the south, looking up into Utah. There's a little cliff here, which uh, uh, is mostly buried right at this point. Then you have another cliff, and the, the, it's, um, it's a set of rock formations that are being eroded into this cliff. Then there's another set of rock formations right above it and more up above it, okay? And so here we're looking at this, at this layer. We call the Vermilion Cliffs. Okay, that's a set of rock formations that just continue. You can see them going off into the distance, uh, 200 miles across southern Utah. They're just continuous. And right above it, you can see this white layer. Okay, that's this one right here. That's the Navajo sandstone. It goes also 200 miles across Utah, and it's a very flat, even layer the whole, the whole way. If you've been to Zion Park, uh, this formation makes Zion Park over here in the distance. So how do you do that? Well, you don't do it by processes that, that we see today. Uh, it takes something that is a very large scale uh, action, uh, covering hundreds, thousands of miles, square miles. And that's reasonable to think would happen during the flood. It certainly does not happen today. Um, 
ca we're causing all kinds of trouble here. Uh, so here's a diagram showing what I was talking about. And this, this diagram is made from actual data on rock formations. Each one of these colored lines is, is one of those rock formations that I just showed you. And this is from here to here is 200 miles. So uh, these, these formations go for hundreds of miles across Utah. Now, if you go out there and study the rocks, <coughs> the, these rock layers, they're in a sequence, one, above the, one layer above the other, one formation above the other. And they're thousands of feet thick. Uh, and we, we put them in categories. The oldest ones, the ones that were formed first, we call Paleozoic. Then the next group above we call Mesozoic. Above that we call Cenozoic. Okay, so you find these, these rocks, one layer above the other. Now the, older part, the lower part of it is like this. That's the way it originally was, these flat-lying layers in, in, the, in the Rocky Mountain region, hundreds of miles, thousands of square miles. Now, if you go up a little farther in the sequence, <coughs> this would be like near the end of the flood. Now you have mountain ranges forming like this. Okay, and now the new layers above that are, are have to be smaller because they're in these valleys. So they're not as such so widespread. So that would be at the end of the flood or after the flood. Now, more erosion happens to, to finally produce the modern landscape. And now, now what kind of geologic processes are happening? Well, here you can see a riverbed. And there'll be other little riverbeds. And they're tiny. To make to, for this thing to even show up, I had to exaggerate how big it is. But it's a river. OK, so this is where, where geologic processes are happening now, depositing mud and sand. They're, they're happening in these riverbeds. So how are you going to make this? by this process. It just doesn't work. So the past was very, very different. And those of us who, who believe in the flood, we understand why it was so different. Um, so how do other geologists explain this? Well, they don't ask this question generally. Um, it's just assumed that somehow it happened, that those rivers spread, mo moved back and forth, and made these flat layers. It doesn't really work when you look at it carefully. <coughs> There are geologists who notice this problem and they, they ponder over it, they make comments on it, but the naturalist worldview does not, would not allow you to consider the possibility of the biblical story. Okay, there's a, there's a um, so just to, to summarize this and to extend it, this, I, this concept of these widespread formations, you can, ex you can extend that globally. There was a geologist in um, the 19, late 1900s, Derek Ager. He was a conventional thinking geologist, but he was very observant. He spent his career traveling around the world to get acquainted personally with geologic formations around the world. And he noticed something that he described in a book. Um, he noticed that a lot of these formations that we, we study here, you can find the same things in other parts of the world at the same time, the same level in the geologic column. Um, so like you probably all heard of the, the White Cliffs of Dover in, in Britain. That's a, f a, ro a formation of, of chalk. Chalk is a very specific kind of deposit. It's, it's billions, untold billions of little uh, microscopic uh, shell, um, you know, skeletons. Okay, and you find those in Britain, you find them across Europe, you find them in Australia, you find it in the southeastern United States. How do you do that? How do you spread one kind of rock formation in such wide places around the world? Um, well, you could do it during a flood, global flood, I presume. Uh, right now, it certainly would not happen. And the Glight Cliffs of Dover are just one example of this. As you go up through the geologic column, there are many places where you can find in, in um, Grand Canyon, you find a, a thick limestone called the Red Wall Limestone. It's in a particular level in the geologic column. The geologic column is this stack of rocks that I'm talking about. You find it there, you find the same kind of limestone with the same fossils in eastern United States, in, in Europe, in Australia. Again, why is that? Well. I think our understanding of Earth history gives them a much more logical explanation than anybody else has. 
Okay, let's look at another thing. <clears throat> another problem with the conventional model. I say bedded sedimentary deposits. Okay, these are, are rock layers made of mud and sand and, and mixtures of those and of pebbles and other materials. And you see them in these distinct layers. Geologists refer to those layers as beds, uh, geologic beds. So that we, we say that they're bedded rocks. They're in layers like this. <clears throat> That's what we're meaning. Uh, why are they in such distinct beds? Why are those beds preserved? Now, why would I wonder if they're preserved? Well, because this sediment gets deposited in places like, like rivers and, and just off the offshore in the ocean and in lakes <coughs> and those kind of places. That's the way they get deposited, and that's recognized as being the source of these deposits. Well, when you're laying down, say you're laying down layers of mud uh, in, in a lake or just in the ocean right near shore, what happens when you do that? <coughs> Here's some more. Uh, Here's some of our groups studying these, these layered rocks, uh, again in Utah. And there's more. They're, they're just, that's typically the way the geologic record is, these nicely beautiful uh, preserved beds, layers of rock. Okay, the problem here is in those environments today where these sediments get deposited, there are animals living in that sediment. They're constantly burrowing through the sediment. They get food particles out of the, out of the mud and out of the sand. So they're constantly burrowing. These are fossil, fossil burrows. I don't know if you can see those. All these little things are fossilized burrows of animals. And there's some right here. These are burrows. Okay, when in the modern world, <coughs> these animals are burrowing in such a way that they, they stir up the sediment uh, and destroy any of these layers that we see, any of these boundaries between the layers. They destroy all of that in days, days to weeks or maybe months, not millions of years. It doesn't, the sediments don't lay there for th millions of years, or even thousands of years, or even a year. The animals destroy all of those layers. They mix them all up. So why didn't that happen in the geologic record? Why are there these layers so finely preserved? Why aren't they destroyed like, uh, by all of these things? Well, they aren't. They, they're just very beautifully preserved. <coughs> so what does that say? Well, here's a, here's a diagram from a book that illustrates um, the effect of these burrowings. If, if these rocks layers get down, lay down very rapidly, you don't have time for all this burrowing. And so you have the layers preserved. If, uh, if it happens a little more slowly, then you get some disturbance from these, these burrows. We call this burrowing process bioturbation. Bio meaning living, living creatures turbating, mixing up the sediments. So a little bit of bioturbation here. If you have a little more time, you get more of it. If you have enough time, the bioturbators destroy all of these layers and you just have uh, homogenized sediment like it's been in your blender. <clears throat> All right, and how long does this take? Well, days, weeks, maybe months. Certainly in a year, there would be no, no, none of those layers left. And yet the geologic record, they're typically preserved. The layers are typically preserved. So what does that say? Well, it says there was very little time. If you had a lot of time, it would look like this. If just a little time, it's like this, and that's what we have. And that's very typical of the geologic record. And so bioturbation should have destroyed all those layers. Um, now, I, I, I know a, a, a lady who was an expert in this study of this bioturbation. She clearly does not believe in creation. Not, you know, not, not for a minute would she think that's real. Um, a friend of mine was in a class taught by her at the university. And she made a comment in class. She said, I don't lose sleep over it, but I wonder why there isn't more bioturbation out there in the rocks. Well, I could give her a suggestion as to why there isn't, because this all happened much too fast uh, to have all that being destroyed by bioturbation. So, <clears throat> summary of this part, there's typically too much preserved bedding. There wasn't enough time for burrowing to destroy 
the bedding. Okay, the evidence, this evidence supports our hypothesis that there was a short time for Earth history since, since the creation and since the flood. There's another very interesting phenomenon in, in Utah and northern Arizona that is, to me, says a lot about this whole process. There's this structure. I mentioned the grand staircase, I think, before. Uh, so this is like a diagram showing a cross-section from central Arizona up to northern Utah. And so you have these rock layers, one above the other. Um, you have all the layers in the Grand Canyon forming what we call the Paleozoic. Then as you go north, you find more layers, more rock formations in what we call the Mesozoic. The Mesozoic is that part of the geologic column where you can find dinosaurs. Uh, you don't find them other parts. And so it's one, one set of formations after the other and, they, and then above that, you have more up here in northern Utah. Okay, and as you go down from up here, each set of, of layers gets cut off in a cliff. They end in a cliff. Okay, and geologists recognize that these layers used to go all the way down here. There's evidence for that. These layers used to cover this whole area, but that, that I mean, eroded back until you have them ending in these cliffs, one after the other, making a staircase. Now, the question is, how do you make something like this? How, what erosion process would erode it this way, uh, taking all this material, many, I mean, unnumberable, unnumbered thousands of cubic miles of sediment has been taken off here and washed down into the ocean. So why would it do that and leave this staircase? And these pictures will show you that staircase is real. It isn't just some geologist's imagination. Um, these pictures are, are, well, right here is the, one of the lowest layers called the, um, uh, uh, it's the Shinarab Cliffs or the Chaka Cliffs, and here's what it looks like if it's well exposed. Now this picture is looking up this way, looking up towards northern Utah. So here's the Chaka Cliffs. That's this one right here. Above that is the Vermilion Cliffs. I showed you pictures of this before. That's right here. Above that is the White Cliffs, the, Jura the Jurassic uh, Navajo Sandstone. That's this one right here. And then looking up beyond that, you, you see this is the White Cliffs, and there you see the Pink Cliffs way up, up here. So this set of cliffs is real. And here we are looking down along this layer, and above it up here are the gray cliffs, and then the, the uh, and you can see them. Um, again, this is just another look. Show This is looking kind of west, so you can see these really are steps, like a staircase. There's one step, and then you've got a very wide step there, and then the next step, then the next step up, Okay, so, so what? Well, <clears throat> how would you form that? Um, and here we are again looking from the bottom up through to the cliffs at the top. How would you form that? If, if rivers eroded this, what do rivers do? Do they make a staircase? Rivers will always have a, a, a cliff or a bank of some kind on each side. Rivers will have a bank on both sides. But the staircase only has a bank on one side. How do you do that? Well, there, there is no geologic process we can see today that would do that. And um, this really, um, it requires water flowing on a very massive scale over all of Utah to do this. Okay, when would that have happened? Well, I think it would happen during the flood. Uh, it certainly will not happen by anything that we can see happening today. So the hypothesis that best explains the evidence is catastrophic water flow over the entire region. So why don't geologists consider this? Well, it just can't, it can't be allowed in their worldview. You can't have that kind of massive process happening because it just is not compatible with what we see happening today. It's not compatible with their millions of years understanding of Earth history. 
another interesting thing, missing time. Okay, how can you have missing time? Now, there, there are some times during the, the uh, last century, during all the wars, it would have been kind of good if we had canceled part of that time, just not let it happen. But time doesn't work that way. So you can't really have missing time. Well, <clears throat> my buddy and I have been studying this, these two rock formations uh, called the Moenkopi Formation and the Shinera Conglomerate. Okay, we study this cliff right here. And usually it's a cliff, so how do you study that? Well, you charter a helicopter, fly along there, and you take hundreds and hundreds of pictures. And you study it that way. And then you climb up, find places where you can climb up and see that. And <clears throat> so why are we interested in that? Well, for a couple of reasons. But well, for one thing, most geologists think there's anywhere from 10 to 30 million years missing right here at that contact. So what do we mean missing? It simply means that this, this formation was deposited, and then the next one didn't get brought in here for, for at least 10 million years. And so that would mean this one was sitting there for 10 million years, uh, or anywhere up to 30, depends on who you read, before this one was deposited. Is that realistic? Well, we've studied that carefully, and uh, and there are many reasons to think that isn't true. Um, for one thing, right at this contact, um, if this had sat in here for 10 million years, that should now be solid rock. It should be solid rock before the next forma formation comes in. And yet, right at that contact, you have things like this, we call load casts, where this sand is pushed down into this, showing that this was still soft. And that's only one reason um, to think that this that time did not happen. There are no, there are no bioturbation, no animal burrows or anything in this mud, as there should be if time had gone on for a long time. And so there really isn't, it doesn't fit the idea that there's time missing. These have to have been deposited one rapidly after the other. And this is only, there are many of these things in the geologic record where there is supposedly missing time, anywhere from a few million years to 150 million years. Well. On the Earth today, you deposit sediment in a valley or, a, or in a lake or something. It doesn't sit there. Every place on the Earth, you either have erosion happening or something is being deposited. Nothing sits there uh, for a long time. And so this idea of this, this long time doesn't fit here. Something is wrong uh, with that time scale. So there's no time missing. There's no significant time missing at this level at all. And the same would be true of the others. <coughs> and that the next line of evidence that is, that is a contrary to this long time period are the well-preserved fossils. There, is, there are so many beautifully preserved fossils all through the geologic column. Uh, how do you preserve a fossil? Well, part of that process just nobody understands. But one thing is understood from, from experimental studies. You either have to bury something very fast or it will not get fossilized at all. And, and there are so many beautiful fossils. Here's a, a, a dragonfly, a completely preserved. These are insect larvae. Okay, those are soft-bodied creatures. You have to bury them in hours or days at most. Uh, you c this rock can't lie around for millions of years while you bury those things. They have to be buried very fast. And there are so many fossils. This is one of the oldest known fossil bats, just like modern bats, and it's beautifully preserved. Here's that fossilized dung that I showed you. Uh, fossil turtle, that thing's about seven feet long. Leaf, completely preserved. There are just way too much well-preserved uh, fossils in the fossil records, requiring a rapid burial. So something has to happen rap rapidly. In fact, I would say that <coughs> uh, the fossil record calls for a global catastrophe. And in fact, you look today for where fossils are forming. And they really are not. Only in very unique situations can you get any fossils preserved. And so I would suggest to you that we, the only reason we have that wonderful fossil record is because of Noah's flood, a ca catastrophe that buried these things uh, very rapidly. <clears throat> okay, so 
finding answers through research. I've, I've shown you some evidence that doesn't fit the long time scale. Can we go farther? Can we do research? Can we begin with a biblical worldview and let that help us to ask questions, ask new questions of the fossil record? And then uh, will that open our eyes to see new things? Use science to get answers. And yes, we can. Let me just give you briefly some examples. Um, this is what I studied during the 1990s up in Wyoming, um, <clears throat> some colleagues and I. There, there's a formation there called the Bridger Formation, has thousands of fossil turtles, beautifully preserved turtles. And it's uh, according to, to uh, the radiometric time scale, this should have taken several million years to, to form. We found these thousands of beautifully preserved turtles. And the evidence showed us that, that these were all mass mortalities. In other words, you have turtles all over this area. They get killed by, by volcanic eruptions up in the Yellowstone region and then buried quickly. And this happened a number of times. So the evidence tells us a, a rapid burial and preservation. Another project. Uh, after we finished in Wyoming, some of us went down to Peru and we studied fossil whales. There are just, again, thousands of beautifully preserved uh, fossil whales in Peru. Here's one. Whales are big. Um, this is the skull and the body. And here's another one. Uh, the, the body is all back here. This is the, the skull. And right here you see baleen. You know, whales have this, this kind of comb-like material in their mouth. They, they sieve out the fossil, the, the living things from the water when they eat. Well, so how did these get so well preserved? There's a whale here and a whale there and a whale over here. They're just, again, unnumber, un, uh, unnumbered fossil whales. And when a whale dies today, what happens to it? Uh, this is being studied by people just off the coast of California. Uh, whales die, they sink to the bottom. Within a few months, the flesh is gone. Within a few years, the bones have been chewed up and, and destroyed, and they're, they're gone. Well, geologists who study this area find that, that the, uh, th they have determined and decided that the sediment is only being deposited a few centimeters thick in a thousand years, a few inches of sediment in a thousand years, and then in the next thousand years, a few more inches. Okay, so how long would it take to bury a whale that's maybe a meter thick? a yard thick, very, very long time, many, many thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. Well, if whales fall apart in a few years, then how's that going to work? And particularly this baleen. Baleen is not bone. It, it gets destroyed very quickly after a whale dies, and yet here it is. And many of these whales have this baleen preserved. This had to have been buried very, very fast. And we documented this, and we actually, uh, you know, I, I, I realized if I want to write a paper that's going to be published in the scientific journal, I have to explain how you're going to bury this sediment that fast. And it, the sediment is mostly little organisms, little diatom skeletons. Well, I did research in, in, in the literature, and I figured out a theory, which got accepted and got published in the scientific literature. And so... <coughs> Because we asked new questions, because our worldview opened our eyes to see, well, this, this somehow the slow sediment deposition and the good preservation just doesn't fit together. Why, are, why is nobody noticing that? And so we noticed things that we would not have noticed if we have not let the Bible at, lead us to ask new questions. And the data supported our, our questions and our conclusions, and we, we got it published. Um, okay, so careful work brings published results. People don't like often the, the conclusions we come to, this, this rapid geologic process. But if you're careful of what you're doing, uh, you can get it uh, published. And so we've had a number of papers published in the scientific literature uh, based on this work. Um, this is... These are papers on some fossil uh, trackways that I studied that are, uh, instead of being in a desert, my evidence said they were to, the trackways were made underwater. Got that published. Here's a paper on our whales. 
Geology is the is the um, the most prestigious journal in the field of geology. And this is our whale on the front, and our article was published here. Whales bite the diatom dust. That that was their title, not ours. But anyway, uh, so we got it published. And so the Lord can open our eyes to see things that we would not have noticed before. And if we do careful work, we then uh, can get it published, usually. Now, we run into two problems at times. <coughs> uh, for instance, one big paper after this one uh, on, the fo on the fossil whales, we sent it to a journal, and they, they s the journal sends it out to experts to review it. They give back their recommendation as to what the journal should do. And one, one, one reviewer for this, this other paper, he wrote about four pages of kind of nitpicking criticisms. And then finally the last page he says, well, actually this is interesting research, but you guys are well-known creationists and we can't trust you. Okay, so the journal didn't publish it. And this happens at times. But we sent it to another journal and um, uh, they accepted it, and the editor said, we think this is going to be a very important paper. So you, you have to be persistent and not let these, these unfair criticisms um, discourage you. So, summary, there are unanswered questions. The bad news is like radiometric dating. We don't know the answer to that. But there is good news and... Um, Evidence for rapid and catastrophic geologic action. All of these research projects that I talked about, and all this, these lines of evidence, they just don't fit that, that millions of years time scale. There is something wrong with the standard conventional interpretation uh, of the rocks. So we need to learn to live with unanswered questions. Some Christians think they have to have proof for our theory of Earth history, our, our flood and short time. They're not comfortable if they don't have proof. Well, we're not gonna have proof. Nobody can have proof on, on these kind of topics on, on things that happened a long time ago. So we need to, to trust the Bible, but careful research brings answers. And particularly, progress comes from taking the Bible as our guide, even in scientific research. So there are abundant reasons to trust um, God's word. We don't build our build our belief on science. Um, our foundation is in is our faith in the word of God. Read your Bible. God is the greatest geologist ever. After all, he's the only one who saw all this happen. Okay, uh, I don't know any geologists who've been there when all this happened. God was there. Pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us, and uh, we can learn many things. Now, there's one advantage we have I want to mention. <clears throat> a lot of scientists criticize creationists. They say, you can't possibly do good scientific research. Well, I do a lot of reading in the anti-creationist publications. And there's one thing I realize that, that I understand that they don't understand. From reading what they write, it's clear that these, these anti-creationists have no idea how an educated creationist thinks. They have no idea how we deal with evidence. They, they don't know, understand us. Um, they only know their point of view. But for those of us who, who do take the Bible seriously, if we're going to do research, we have to know everything that they know. We have to know all about their point of view and why they believe what they do. And we also understand our point of view. So they know one point of view. We know both points of view. That gives us a tremendous advantage. My friends and I were all the time looking at this, the biblical framework and this conventional framework and asking ourselves, okay, where can we find places where we can test between these two? And they don't, the, 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 the other scientists don't understand this. But we have this definite advantage. We understand both points of view and we're all the time seeing how we can test between them. And that gives us an advantage in research that they don't have. Uh, they would be, they could do better, they could support their theory better if they did understand our point of view as well as theirs, but they just don't. Okay, now there's the next part that comes, that can come in right away. So 
so we've been looking at, at rocks now and what the rocks, what we can learn from the rocks. Now we're going to turn to the biological uh, evidence, to, the, to, to Darwin's theory of evolution. <clears throat> and I'm asking a, what can seem like a kind of impertinent question. Can evolution survive the new biological insights? And so asking that question may sound a little arrogant. It sounds like I'm suggesting the answer might be no. Well, let's take a look at that. So the goals of this talk to evaluate the current state of the evidence for the evolution of life forms by random mutation and natural selection. That's Darwin's theory. All this change, all the, everything we see living around us came, came to be by random mutations and natural selection. Okay, a little bit of history, just one screen here of history to put a, to set a background for this. Darwin wrote his book in the mid-1800s. Okay, keep in mind, molecular biology was unknown. Nobody understood what a cell is. A cell to them was a little, little bag with some stuff floating in it. That's all they knew. Genetics was decades in the future. Okay, so they were ignorant on these topics uh, completely at that time. Then you go fast forward to 1930s and 40s. Uh, several prominent scientists put together a new synthesis building on Darwin's theory. This is called uh, the Neo-Darwinian synthesis or the modern synthesis. So they took information from paleontology, um, population biology, genetics, mathematical biology, they put this all together in this synthesis, which is the evolution as it is understood today. Now this, in the 30s and 40s, they still didn't know anything really about molecular biology. And of course, that's where the action, action is in, in terms of what's happening in the cell and genetics and all that is happening in the cell. Molecular biology really got going in about the 1950s and it's been advancing very rapidly in recent years. So this is a, a little framework that helps you to put this in context. Now, so I'm gonna ask the question, what do we know now we didn't know a few decades ago? And <clears throat> a few years ago, I gave a talk on this topic to a group of, of uh, Adventist um, teachers, science teachers. And one of them asked me a question. He said, now evolutionists seem to be more confident of the theory now than before. Is that because there's new evidence? Okay, I'm gonna try to answer that question for you here. And when I say, what do we know now? One thing we know now is that in the last five to 10 years, there's been spectacular advance in genetics and molecular biology, understanding what what really is life? What, how does life work? Okay, as we get into this now, a couple of definitions we have to deal with quickly. <coughs> Microevolution and macroevolution. Uh, these words are not always uh, uh, defined the same, so I'll tell you how I'm defining them. Microevolution is adaptation, changes within a species. So uh, here are two lizards. They look very different, right? Those are the same species of lizards. This one lives on the gray granite rocks in Southern California. This one lives on red sandstone in Arizona. So um, this is microevolution, changes within a species that adapt it to the environment that it lives in. Um, macroevolution is evolution of major groups of organisms, orders, classes, and phyla. So how do you go from a bacteria to a fish? And how do you go from a fish to a reptile and then to a mammal. That's, that's macroevolution. Microevolution is adaptation, say, within a created group of organisms. And mic micro, microevolution, you're dealing with things similar to why some of us have blue eyes and some of us have brown eyes, other things that don't require evolving any new genes, probably no new genes. You don't have to evolve new things to do this. <laughs> Macroevolution, if you're gonna go from a reptile to a mammal, you gotta invent a way to, to make live birth happen, and think how complex that is, and how to have a, a temperature regulation that we have, and a whole lot of things. You have to invent these, evolve these really new, um, different features. That's macroevolution, so that's the difference 
uh, between these two. So, and I would propose to you that microevolution and even the development of new species is compatible with creation. It's adaptations since the creation, whereas macroevolution is contrary to biblical uh, creation. The Bible says God made reptiles, he made birds, he made mammals, he made us, he made fruit trees. So that doesn't fit macroevolution. So how does microevolution work? What is the process? And this is the accepted evolution theory for microevolution and macro, but it, it would involve both. You have to have two things, random mutations and natural selection. And those two concepts are the core of Darwinian theory. So when I talk about neo-Darwinism or Darwinism or Darwinian theory, this is what I'm talking about. This is their theory, random mutations and natural selection. Okay, um, why are those important? Those are very important for the standard theory of evolution because if you're gonna go from this to this, you could, there are two ways you could do this. You could have an intelligent input that's, make, that's messing with the genes and changing them. Or you could have random changes, random mutations. If you're not gonna have a creator, everyth everything that's new has to start with random mutations. The mutation process cannot know what would be good for the organism. Because if the process knew that this organism should have this, this change, then uh, that would indicate that there's some intelligence somewhere that's messing with the system. And, and, and if, if you're using Darwinian theory, you cannot have intelligence, you cannot have an intelligent creator involved. Okay, so this is why random mutation is very important for Darwinism. Keep that in mind, because this is gonna come, we're gonna come back to that as, as we're going through here. Okay, so <clears throat> just to summarize that, um, the process must be random. Foresight, that is knowing ahead of time what's needed, would imply creation or intelligent design. So here's a little analogy I have for this process. It's something, it's from an automobile factory. So here you got a machine that makes pistons. You have a, con a computer that controls it. And now you say you have something like, like maybe lightning or electric spark hits this thing. And it changes one of the instructions. Random, a random change changes one of the instructions. Now it makes wider pistons. Okay, that's, that's an analogy for evolution. Random changes um, change how things are, are built. Okay. And now I'm gonna go through, that's the theory. I'm gonna go through some problems that are arising for, no, I lost the whole thing. Problems, problems that are arising for uh, Darwin's theory. <clears throat> for the theory of random mutation and natural selection. Problems are rapidly increasing, especially because of advances in molecular biology. Uh, remember Darwin, when Darwin wrote his book, Nothing was known about molecular biology. And so now we have, we're new learning things that he would have no idea what was it about. So let's go through some of these problems. Problem number one, junk DNA. You heard of junk DNA? That's the belief that 98% of our human DNA is junk, left over from the evolution process. It's of no use. Okay, w would you be willing to have 98% of your DNA removed? <laughs> Probably not. But that's, that's the theory. It has been the theory. 98% of human days DNA is called silent DNA because it doesn't seem to be doing anything. Now, the other 2% are what we call protein coding genes. They have instructions for making proteins. But the 98% doesn't do that. And so this thought to be junk DNA. Functionless remnants of evolution. And not only is it is it junk left over from evolution. But that junk DNA is important for the evolution process because it's thought that that's, that those, those junk DNA, those genes are material that can now mutate and make a new gene. Okay, so that's important for evolution. Well, 
problems begin to appear. Here's a, here's a graph that was made based on a, a very large literature, literature study. And they found that, um, th well, let's look at this graph. See, this is uh, from zero to 100%. And so these little prokary prokaryotes, the very simplest organisms, they only have about five to 20%, 10 to 20% of their ge uh, genes, of their DNA, is junk. They don't have very much junk DNA. But you go up here to one-celled organisms, plants, invertebrates, chordates, vertebrates, humans. The more complicated the organisms are, the more junk DNA they have. Until humans have 98% junk DNA. Now, does something look fishy to you there? The more complicated they are, the more junk DNA. It looks like that junk DNA is somehow involved in making, their, making them complex. Like it's maybe the most important part of, of the DNA. Well, um, so the junk DNA seems to be involved in producing the complexity. And through the years, I remember uh, seeing papers appear periodically in, in prominent scientific journals. They were finding parts of that junk DNA that are important. This is one of my favorites. Uh, it's the junk that makes us human. So from the very prestigious journal Nature, could it be the non-coding DNA that makes us human? So little clues now and then building up that something is important in that junk DNA. And it finally reached, reached uh, its climax in 2012 with the publication of, of, this, uh, of this journal, the completion of a project called the ENCODE project. <clears throat> the ENCODE project, that's a massively government supported project with hundreds of molecular, the best molecular biologists around the world studying all parts of our DNA to see what it might be doing. And their conclusion at the end was this junk DNA is not junk. It's doing important things. In fact, actually, it is regulatory G DNA that's controlling the protein coding DNA. It telling, it's telling the protein coding DNA, DNA when and where to make its protein and what that protein is going to be doing. There were 30 papers published all at once, and the evolutionary biologists do not like it. They're, they're fighting against this conclusion and do not want to accept it because junk DNA is important for their theory. So the supposed junk DNA controls whether our protein coding DNA will make a human, a chimpanzee, or a mouse. Uh, a lot of our proteins are, are similar to chimpanzee and not quite so many, but still a lot of them are similar to a mouse protein. Okay, what are proteins? <clears throat> They're like bricks. You can, you can take the same bricks and you can make a doghouse or a palace, depending on the engineering drawings that you have, okay? So um, this, this regulatory DNA that used to be called junk is now we know that that's what's telling those proteins what to make, a human, a chimpanzee, or a mouse. And so that is a very critical importance. And junk DNA is really no longer a useful concept. Now, when, in the 1970s, I remember some of my molecular biology uh, colleagues at Loma Linda predicting that it will be found that junk DNA is not junk. Well, it's been only creationists who've been predicting that until recently. Now, of course, it's known that there's no such thing as junk DNA. It's, it's very important material. Okay, so that's a problem for, for Darwinism. Now, problem number two. We've got this tree of life, supposedly showing how everything has evolved from a common ancestor, starting from bacteria and then, of course, going on before that. Well, this tree of life is, is the, the common ancestry of all organisms is facing serious setbacks. And there are a number of these. I'm going to mention primarily one. <coughs> If to, to have this, according to Darwinian theory, you cannot evolve anything in big jumps. To evolve a new organism or even a new gene, it has to go just very tiny changes at once based on those, on those um, random mutations. You barely change it gradually through time. And, and it, so that's why it takes millions of years for this to happen, for small changes. You cannot have a gene popping into existence all of a sudden. Uh, that would imply that there's a creator somewhere in the process. But what are we finding? 
not me, but other but molecular biologists. Um, well, something they've been finding is orphan genes. Genes that just seem to appear with no evolutionary ancestry. Uh, for, give you one example of these. Honeybees, they have some genes that tell them how to make honey. That's pretty important for a honeybee. Uh, it amazes me how the honeybee knows how to make honey. It doesn't even spoil. Well, those genes that tell a honeybee how to make honey are orphan genes. You cannot find any ancestors, ancestral genes in any insect that would show how those genes evolved. They just popped into existence in honeybees. Okay, and that's not an isolated example. In fact, at least 10 to 20 percent of genes in all organisms are orphan genes. We have at least a thousand of those. Genes that are in humans that are not in chimpanzees, they're not in any other organism. They just are there, like somebody created them there, because knowing that we would need them. And in fact, I think that's, of course, the best explanation. Um, some of these are responsible for our large human brain. So orphan genes are a very serious problem for evolutionary biology. And I'll talk a little bit later about how evolutionary biologists are, are dealing with that. The next issue is epigenetics. This is something that's been studied since the 1980s, but really is becoming prominent in recent years. Epigenetics. That's a management system that determines how to use the DNA. Okay, DNA is, is a massive amount of information, but it, uh, our, our, our DNA is like a hard drive in your computer. If you take your hard drive out of your computer, how much can it do? Absolutely nothing. The, the, it is full of information, which is critical for the computer. But the computer has to have a management system to determine how to use that information. And it's now understood that a living thing is the same way. There are, there are levels of management above the DNA, outside of the DNA, that determines how to use the information uh, in DNA. And I don't know if you can see it, but there are little pink things here, little tags. Those are little chemical tags that, that the epigenetic system puts on genes. And they turn genes on or off, or decide, uh, you know, sort of regulate how much they're used. So this is this management system that controls the DNA, decides which genes to use, which to turn off, which to turn on. That's epigenetics. And it does not change the information in the DNA. These are not mutations. It does not change the letters and the words in the DNA. They do not change, but they're either turned on or off. Um, okay, you remember this text. It talks about punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. I, I often ponder, what does that mean? It doesn't sound, it sounds odd. Well, now we know what it means because of epigenetics. Here's an article published in the prominent and the very famous journal, Nature, Sins of the Father. Where did they get that title from? Okay, this is epigenetics. That's exactly what epigenetics does. Um, the, in, the, the way we live, the, what we eat, the stress we go through, uh, all the things in our lives influence what our children will be like. That's why mothers are told to be careful what you eat. Um, who was it? John the Baptist's uh, parents were not to drink any strong drink. Okay, all these things affect children, and it can, it can affect them for several generations. This article has an example of this. Uh, male mice, <coughs> white mice, were exposed for sev over several days, once in a while, uh, given the odor of, of peach blossoms. Okay, that's a very gentle odor. It doesn't do anything wrong. But... When they hurt, when they smell that odor, they'd get a gentle shock on their foot. Okay, they did this over three days, and then and um, after that, the males gave a very negative response to smelling that odor. Okay, then no more shocks, no more odor. They mate those males with with females, and then they have offspring, who have never been getting this kind of treatment, but the young ones, when they smell peach blossom odor they give the same reaction as their fathers did. Somehow where did they get that? Somehow it was carried to them in their DNA through this epigenetic process. And, 
and um, and not only did they react the same way, but it made changes in their anatomy of their of their olfactory system. So this is serious. This is real, uh, something very real that's changing, and it kept it it. It stayed for several generations. So that's epigenetics. Okay, so, um, and epige epigenetics research is just blossoming. They're finding more and more things that are, that are epigenetic. So, um, so why is this a problem for evolution? Why is it a problem for Darwinism? Well, let me give you another example first. <coughs> Blind cave fish. Now, I've always taught my students what's, what's believed to be true, and that is fish live in other organisms living in caves. They, they can't see anything, and so if they get mutations that damage their eyes, uh, it doesn't matter. And so they, they, you know, they don't, don't have to have eyes. Well, that's what I've taught them. I also tell my students sometimes that half of what we're teaching you is wrong. Okay, the problem is we won't know what part is wrong until science moves on and makes more discoveries. Okay, well, here we have an example. The old explanation is that random mutations destroyed the sight. Now it's known that's not true. Um, it's epigenetics. The blind cave fish have all their, their eye genes intact. There's no mutations there. But epigenetics, somehow the process recognizes they don't need eyes, so those eye genes are turned off. Can you imagine? So they, they, they somehow, their bodies know that they can turn those eyes off. Now, so, okay, so why is that a problem for Darwinism? Remember, if you're not going to have a creator involved, the changes cannot be done in a way that knows what would be good for the organism. They have to be random. Well, epigenetic um, environmental influences initiate changes that are beneficial, Somehow that process knows what will be good for the organism. They are inheritable and they're non-random. So that's a serious problem for, for Darwinism because it looks like there's something or somebody in the process that knows what is needed and knows how to bring about those necessary changes. All right. Um, somebody... There was some intelligent awareness behind the design or operation of this system. Well, that just doesn't fit Darwinism. And it's significant to me that, that evolutionary biologists are fighting this concept of, of uh, epigenetics. They, they try to deny that it's real. Next one is irreducible complexity. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You've probably heard of it. But here's a, here's a structure in bacteria. This, this is a... This is a, um, a fiber, sort of an extension out of the bacteria that, that turns. Why does it turn? Because it has a, uh, the same thing as an electric motor. Uh, it works just exactly like an electric motor, has the parts of an electric motor, the spin, uh, and, and turn this thing. Okay, if you're trying to evolve this, how would you do that? That motor's not going to work unless the whole thing is there all at once. You can't evolve one little tiny bit then the next little tiny bit. And you have to have it all there, all there at once. That's irreducible complexity. It has to reach a certain level of complexity before it will work. So how would you evolve something like that? And there's a lot of evidence for that, and, and this is a serious problem for Darwinism. It's again something that the Darwinists are denying. They don't want to accept it. And you look at this critter. Okay, that's irreducible complexity. You take off, take out his liver, it doesn't work. Take out his kidneys, he doesn't work. I mean, he has to be there uh, all at once for him to work. Okay. I don't know what's with this thing. Hopefully it'll, we can make it through here. Um, oops. Okay. Problem number five. Other new insights from molecular biology. There's a group of new evolutionists, as they're called. They recognize that Darwinian random mutations and natural selection don't work. Now, that's pretty serious, isn't it? Darwin's process does not work. New genetic information must arise some other way. Now, keep in mind one thing here. These people are not, are not creationists that I'm talking about. These are scientists who, who probably believe 
somehow evolution happened. But they realized that Darwin's theory does not work. They don't, they don't know how to explain how it works. They just know it doesn't work. Let's see here. Okay, here we go. Okay, here are some things that, that one of these people is very insightful. Uh, I love his book. It's called Evolution of View from the 21st Century. And <clears throat> he's, he's one of those who recognizes that Darwin doesn't work. And he's very outspoken. And um, he, he says, the modern evolutionary synthesis included an ad hoc assumption about the random nature of hereditary variation. Okay, what's ad hoc? Ad hoc means it's a theory, it's something that you do not get from the evidence, but it's required by the theory. Okay, evolution theory requires that these be random, but the evidence doesn't support that. That's what it means here. He recognized that. This was a, a, a ad hoc assumption. And I like this next statement. It requires great faith to believe that a process of random accidental genome change could make new things, could make creatures change in you know, positive ways. And he says here, heredity change results from active cell processes rather than a series of random accidents. Okay, so evolution, he's saying, yeah. Okay. Okay, now we're on. Okay, so he's saying it is not random change, and he calls this natural genetic engineering. Cells are now reasonably seen to operate teleologically. That means the cell is operating with purpose. The cell has a purpose. Its goals are survival, growth, and reproduction. So the cell somehow knows what it needs to do. Now, how does he fit this with evolution theory? He just simply says, well, it's a mystery, which is a good way to describe it. Uh, it's a mystery. He doesn't know how it works. He just knows that Darwinism is wrong. So these new evolutionists, how do they explain the evolution process? With these active cell processes, not random accidents, the cells have goals, which they're working toward. And this is an amazing statement. The complex biochemistry in the cell decides how to interpret the DNA. The cell decides how to use the DNA. Wow, um, there's much more to life than we ever guessed. So random mutations are not the source of genetic change. Uh, that's what's being found by these molecular biologists. Now, so remember I showed you this, this analogy of the genetic process? Um, all of this, these discoveries tell me you have to make a change in this diagram. This, this simple crude analogy of how evolutionary biologists think the process works, that's like if I take my computer and I jam a screwdriver in it to see if it'll make it work better. Do you think it will? Okay. Uh, mutations are known to be mostly detrimental, destructive. Almost all of them are. And so that's, that's one reason why this process doesn't work. So it's really more like this. Instead of this simple crude process, you got this machine with a computer, then you got sensors in your engine, since this is a, a, an analogy from an automobile. You get sensors that, c that detect uh, vibration, stress, temperature, a lot of things, and then they send information to all these control modules. Uh, stage one, stage two, stage three controllers, which are analyzing all this, and processing this information, sending an information back to the master controller. That's more like how the cell actually works. And you've got error, error correction, damage repair. Um, the simplest cell has an awesome array of, of mechanisms to correct mistakes in the DNA. It's, it's an it's a incredibly sophisticated system. And that's what this molecular biologist I just referred to, 
He says the cell is far too sophisticated for random mutations to have any real effect. And there's something else here. I'm calling this standby piston specification software. So you've got standby information to be used if it's needed. Okay, and what, is that, what does that uh, mean? So this would be, I would say, organisms have standby genetic information to allow them to make changes that are going to be needed. And how is that going to happen unless, unless somebody designed those organisms to do that? And here's my example. <coughs> so many kinds of dogs. And, and dogs, there's evidence to indicate dogs came from wolves. All right, so were there any dogs on the ark? Well, I don't know, but, but there are some kinds of dogs that are so similar to wolves it really doesn't matter. The, the dogs get their inheritance from wolves. Um, and you get this incredible um, range of diversity. Would this wolf be happy to accept all these as his descendants? In some cases here, I think he might be embarrassed. Um, but, and, and how do we know this happened this way? Well, there are at least 200 varieties of dogs that have been produced by selective breeding in the last couple of centuries. We know the history of those breeds of dogs. And they did not come by mutation. There's some very rare mutations uh, in dogs, but most of it is all epigenetic. And in 200 years, you cannot evolve this much change. This, that information had to be already there. The wolves had to have this information to make all these kinds of dogs. Uh, it had to have been made there in the first place. Uh, so how did that happen? Well, and I've read articles by, by an evolutionist pondering why how could dogs could have so much genetic variability? How would you evolve that? Why would it evolve? It would not. There is no, there is no naturalistic way you could explain this. That information had to be all there to provide for these dogs. Uh, I would explain it this way. It must be that the creator made wolves with dogs in mind. He knew we would need companionship and protection and all the other things that come from, from uh, dogs from pets. Uh, dogs can, uh, can be trained to sniff out cancer that we can't detect. Uh, the people living in the far north would never have survived without their sled dogs. So dogs are very important to us. And I believe the Creator knew that. And there's no other animal that has anywhere near this kind of genetic variability. It had to be put there for a reason by somebody. And so dogs, they're a good example uh, of epigenetics and why God made epigenetics. Okay, compare dogs with cats. <sighs> cats just don't have very much genetic flexibility. Uh, sure, there are lions and things, but he, he took at all these small kinds of cats. Now, there are plenty of cat lovers who have tried to breed different varieties of cats, and they have. But, you know, you, you cut off their hair to get rid of the color chit differences, and they're all about the same. There, there really is very little genetic variability in cats. And so there's a strong contrast between dogs and cats. And cats are more like most animals. Uh, they, most animals just don't have anywhere near the kind of genetic variability that dogs have. So why did God make cats? Well, people usually laugh when I ask that question. I would say he, he must have made cats to keep us humble, to, to remind us that we're not in charge. But um, anyway, so dogs are a, a good example of, of this standby genetic information that was put there in the first place. And we see the results now. And so <coughs> come back to this diagram. Okay, if random mutations do happen, which is random damage, what is the most likely result? Well, you can't really read this, but one is system failure. We die of cancer. From, from, and there's, you know how, often, how frequent cancer is. Um, there's plenty, there are these mutations that happen that are destructive. Another problem is reduced efficiency. Uh, these mutations can reduce the effectiveness of how our body works. Anybody identify with that? Um, a, a real, uh, probably the most like, most common change is that, the most common result rather is that mutation is eliminated by the error correction system. And so there are a lot of errors that, that happen. They just get corrected right away. But if they're not corrected right away, then these other things happen. 
So mutation is not going to make something new. It's a destructive process, and it cannot, it's some of these molecular biologists recognize that it, it will not make something new. Okay, I'm going to use a couple series of diagrams to illustrate some things that are changing. Um, in this diagram, I have these green lines. Any explanation in here is a naturalistic explanation. If you cross this green line, you get up into the area where, uh, of creationism and, and miracles. Okay, so it's been thought for years that, that macroevolution is just microevolution happening over a long time. So those microevolutionary changes add up to make macroevolution, to make something new. This has been the standard explanation uh, until more recently. Now new evidence is, is pushing these apart. It's showing that to, to many scientists that no, macroevolution is a different process from microevolution. And I identify completely with, with that sentiment. They're not the same. And more evidence is driving them farther apart. Macroevolution, like I said, that's the making of really new structures, new features. And how do you do that with microevolution? Um, natural selection cannot make anything do, new. It does absolutely nothing towards making something new. All natural selection do is eliminate those that are not very well fit. Something else has to account for any new genes. How do they come in? Well, that really is not understood. So more, more information yet is, is uh, in my, to I conclude, is driving microevolution theory up into the area that's compatible with creationist explanations. It's being found that microevolution does not take thousands of years as it used to be thought. It can happen very quickly, a few years. Uh, finch beaks in, in, in the Galapagos uh, adjusting to different food sources brought on by a, by a drought, for instance. Um, these changes up here can happen rather quickly. That's being understood now. So rapid adaptation, uh, epigenetics, experimental studies on, on uh, microevolution, all these things, and I think microevolution within created limits, I think that no evolution happens except within the limits of the genetic potential that God made there for each group of organisms. So. I would suggest that microevolution is being easier, most easily explained now within a creationist framework. So how about macroevolution? Well, macroevolution theory, quite frankly, is collapsing. I, I told you about the molecular biologists who were saying um, that, <coughs> na that random mutation will not do it. It's not, it does, it, Darwinism doesn't work. Random mutations are not a satisfactory way to explain what we see. So we have intelligent design. Is, there's met a lot of evidence for intelligent design that's needed to explain organisms. Uh, no junk DNA, orphan genes, irreducible complexity, epigenetics, all these things are causing macroevolution, Darwinian theory, to collapse. Now, will you, are you going to read this in any evolution books? Absolutely not. Um, you have to be in touch with the, with the research literature to understand what's actually going on. But, but um, I would say, in fact, macroevolution, we can argue about the microevolution, but macroevolution theory is collapsing. The evidence favors uh, creation. Okay, so what are the evolutionary biologists, how are they responding to these challenges? Challenges of no junk DNA, orphan genes, epigenetics, and the failure of Darwinism. How are they responding? Well, I bought, um, a year or two ago, I bought the latest version of all these evolutionary textbooks to see what they had to say. And none of these mention orphan genes. They, they just ignore it. Um, the older ones don't mention epigenetics. The newer ones will mention it. They might have a sentence to a page and a half, but all of them kind of discount it and try to claim that it, does, it isn't of any significance. Well, that's not realistic. The molecular biologists who are, who are being honest about this tell us that's not realistic. They're not facing reality. In fact, in one of those molecular biology books uh, that criticizes them, um, it says that um, 
these evolutionary biologists criticize him for what he's saying. He's saying their criticisms are philosophical, not scientific, and they, they are not supported by empirical evidence. So, and he also says that these evolutionary biologists are, are ignoring three decades of molecular biology research. Okay, the evolutionary, the molecular biologists are the ones who know what's happening in the genetic system. Uh, these biologists are not generally ev molecular biologists, and they're, they're fighting the findings of uh, molecular biology. But there, there are four other books here. <coughs> they're also by evolutionists, but they're by evolutionists who recognize that epigenetics is real and is here to stay. And they're trying to use epigenetics to, as a basis for a new theory of evolution. Um, I'm not sure how they're going to get around some of the problems that epigenetics seems to require intelligence. Uh, I don't know how they're going to deal with that, but they're trying to develop a, a new theory. They also don't have an explanation for how you get new things like skeletons or kidneys or, you know, all these other things. But they're trying. They're trying to deal with it. So macroevolution is facing increasingly serious challenges. So these eminent uh, uh, evolutionists, primarily molecular biologists, are raising these challenges and rejecting Darwinian theory. So Let's come back to the question that teacher asked me a few years ago. Why are evolutionary biologists, why do they seem to be more committed to the theory than ever? Well, that is really quite clear. It's because of philosophy, not because of evidence. The evidence is going decidedly against them. But it's their philosophical commitment to naturalism. That's why they are so confident. And so I would diagram that this way. Here's this, this line. You don't cross this line if you're going to stay within naturalistic theory. But here we have a group of scientists who, who are not creationists, but they just recognize that Darwinism doesn't work. But then you've got a, a group of others that I would call the hardline Darwinists, Dawkins, Coyne, Miller, Pennock, Prothero, and others. They stay within, uh, they stay out of creationist thinking. They stay within these lines here because of philosophical commitments. They are committed to a naturalist point of view and so they stick with their theory no matter what. That's why they're so confident. And I, and I think also I see evidence that, that many of them, the ones who think about it more, are, are scared. Is their theory going to survive? Well, it, it doesn't look like it really to, to those of us who really study the, air f in the evidence carefully. And if a person is afraid, they're likely to lash out in anger. And some of what's happening, I believe, is in that category. If um, I read the story about a pastor who's working on his sermon notes, and he has written in the margin, argument weak, shout louder. Well, perhaps that's what's happening here. So... Darwinian theory of evolution through random mutations is facing deadly challenges. And there's this growing conflict within science. I'm not talking about an argument between creationists and evolutionists. Within science, there's this conflict between hardline Darwinists and the new evolutionists who recognize the collapse of Darwinism. So this, these are not minor issues. This is a new day for creationists. We used to really wonder how we're going to explain all this. Well, they have the problem now. We don't. So how can we grasp the full truth about origins? Um, to really understand, I mean, we talk in evolution books, we talk about little, this little argument, this little issue, this little issue. To really understand it requires getting a broad and deep understanding of life and all the complexities of the processes. And this is my final conclusion. The deeper our broad-scale knowledge of the processes of life becomes, the more likely it is that ideas like chemical evolution that is evolving the first life and large-scale macroevolution will sink into an abyss of impossibility right next to a plan to build a railroad to Mars. So that sounds like a strong conclusion, but that, I'm, I feel strongly, is where the evidence is leading. And so... Uh, our, our, our standard is still the Bible. Uh, 
we, our belief is based on is faith in God's word, but God is using science to give us more confidence. And, and so I'm, delight, I'm delighted with that. I still base my, my beliefs on the Bible, on faith, but, um, but science is in fact helping us, and that's a delightful thing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brand. I'm sure that uh, he's generated some questions. Uh, and so we're going to take a brief time here for Q&A. And if you have a question you would like to ask, uh, please raise your hand. Don't holler out. Just raise your hand, and we'll get a microphone uh, in your hand. So Art. OK. You were talking about large, large areas with, um, with rock formations and sedimentary layers and such. And um, it seems to me that if you believe in ice ages and um, certain tectonic activities, then uh, you could, it would be easy to understand that there, there, there could have been large areas of seas that um, would have that would have quite possibly um, deposited a uh, uniform sediment underneath each sea. Um, that does that doesn't that um, follow a naturalistic um, explanation of those? Well, actually, <coughs> um, there is evidence that the that the continents were once covered by seas, by shallow seas. So that fits nicely into our theory. Um, the other scientists also have an explanation for it. So yeah, there were seas, but many of the information we talk about are not actually uh, marine deposits. They are more terrestrial environments, and in those have the same features. Um, like the one of them I showed is this Chenier conglomerate. It's, it's sand and little rock pebbles like you get in a stream bed. And the, th the explanation they give is these streams wander over this area. But streams don't cover, uniformly cover, 150,000 square miles. So yeah, you, you're, what you're asking could explain a little of it, but, but. And that's why, that's why I'm thinking of more of a sea. In fact, when I look at certain areas like, say, um, the Great Salt Lake area, and even um, the Columbia River Gorge, it's, it seems obvious to me and, and you, can e you can even see it in the shapes. Uh, um, it, it, seems, it seems obvious to me that there, was, that there were large inland seas and that the um, Columbia River Gorge was essentially where it sprung a leak and, w and, um, and washed a gorge on its way to lower elevation. So I, I don't know, um, cons uh, consistent um, sedimentation sounds like uh, what I would expect underneath the sea. Uh, somewhat, although even under the sea, it's not it's not smooth. But even though, but that could explain uh, perhaps uh, some of it, but not but not anywhere near all of it. There are many of those formations that are not marine. They're not under a sea. They're they're basically terrestrial, and they still you have the same thing. Is there anything around the edges? That this would be an, some interesting research. Of if you were to look at all, each of those large um, areas of sedimentation. Is there anything around the edges, the boundaries of them, that would suggest why the boundary? Like, like for instance, uh, signs of uplift or, or something else? Well, if you look to, uh, the, say there's a formation that, I, that one of my colleagues studies a lot in Wyoming. It's, it's in the upper part of that column. It's called the Green River Formation. And it's in a big lake that would have been post-flood, clearly. And yeah, you can see where the shoreline was. Um, but that's, that's radically different from these older, much more, more widespread deposits. Um, there, there are, and some of the other, other formations, even below the Green River Formation, that would have been, um, say, after, after the main, if we understand the flood, it would have been after the main part of the flood, 
when the mountain ranges came up. Then you, then you have formations filling in those valleys. So this is not when the earth was covered with seas. These formations are filling in these valleys between the mountains. Those you can see where the edges are. But not these older ones that are just go for hundreds of miles. Has anyone taken, say, altitude measurements of these various long layers to, to determine whether they are sloped or follow the, um, like the curvature of the earth if it was covered by water? Okay, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> there are lots of, there's lots of information on altitudes. The problem is it doesn't really help. It doesn't tell you anything because different parts of the earth have moved up or down over time. Um, even in, in, in Italy, there's a place where uh, one of the Roman market marketplaces, at the time of, uh, in Bible times, it was just, just above the ocean level. In the Middle Ages, it began to sink, uh, and it sunk by about 18 feet, and then finally it came up again after that. And so, but that's an extreme case. But they're, they're, the, the earth in general has moved around. The Rocky Mountain areas in our country are five to 7,000 feet high. They obviously were not that high originally. The, the things have moved up and down and, and moved a lot. And so uh, the altitude measurements we could take now won't help to, to answer your question. Why is radiometric dating you said you can't really disprove it. I mean, and that's what everybody uses to prove millions and billions of years, right? For it, why is that so hard? To, I, I don't know. I, I mean, it's hard to understand it. And you said you can't. It can't really be disproved. And well, e eventually it, it probably could be, and you know we're looking at ways to study that. But um, it, it's just it's a complicated process, and it hasn't been studied enough by people who are looking for answers. Now, there are some answers, and, and actually understanding the process um, doesn't make it so fearsome looking. For instance, there is no machine you, could, you have or that could even be invented that could take a rock and tell you how old it is in years. All it can tell you is the ratio of what's called a, a parent isotope and the daughter isotope. It can give you that ratio, and then you make some assumptions, and you calculate, calculate an age. So it, it's, not, it's not like uh, it's unchallengeable, but um, it's, it's a difficult <coughs> physics it, problem, and so um, it hasn't been studied enough to really know what the answers are. Dr. Brand, doesn't this kind of play into the, uh, to the idea of, you know, that, that we have as creationists with um, God creating with an appearance of age? Because, you know, I mean, how do you know how different a new rock looks like from an old rock? I mean, it, it seems so relative, and, and <clears throat> yet f from our understanding from the Genesis account, um, you know, when God created vegetation, he didn't come down and just throw a bunch of seeds there. Mm -hmm. I mean, he raised up trees that I don't know whether they had rings in them or what, but mm -hmm. he created them with an appearance of age. Yeah, that's, that's I, I think, is right. Um, but to try to apply that to the rocks, that's a little more difficult. We can understand why a tree that's just been created may have needed rings to, to give it its rigid structure. But rocks were formed during the flood. God didn't create those rocks. They were formed by processes during the flood. And we can look at rocks and, and look and see if there's evidence of, of being old or not. Uh, leaving radiometric dating aside, you can look at the rocks and tell if they look older or not. And it really doesn't tell us what, what you might want to know. Anyone else with a question? Ah, we've got one way over here. Stanny. It's kind of a weird question. Uh, we believe in God and we believe in his creation. Uh, coming from a different background, not religious, but coming from a different part of, part of the world and reading all the religious book, do you think 
they believe in a different creationist. Uh, they be believe in a different God. Similar aspect that uh, he has created uh, human and mm -hmm. uh, other things. Mm -hmm. Do you think that both things align somewhere or what is the difference if you know about their crea uh, creation theory? Okay, so you're, you're, you're really asking how does God decide if we are his child or not, right? I mean, that's that fair to well, summarize it? It's a little bit complicated because uh, in Bible it tells us that we are created in his image. Mm -hmm. And that is, I, that is a perfect uh, uh, sentence and it, it makes sense. In their theology, um, it's different. It, it, it's hard to explain because uh, there are three gods, um, mm -hmm. God of creation, God of maintenance, and God of destruction. And according to them, we are created from the belly button of one of the God. Mm -hmm. So I, I still, I'm still trying to align that. Not, not that I, I, I want to accept it, but I wanted to when I, when I discuss with them, I wanted to debunk that, that it, it's kind of a ridiculous mm -hmm. to believe that what, what they are believing. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> okay, so you, you sh are you asking how we should relate to them or how God sees it? No. Uh, first of all, they are not uh, trying to accept science in their religion. I mean, at mm -hmm. least we are trying here. They are not because it's a, it's a, it's a closed uh, religion book. You cannot change, you cannot update your mm -hmm. uh, theory or mindset either, mm -hmm. uh, Hinduism. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so in that sense, I wanted to ask that, uh, do you think the science is, uh, going towards that with this, the evolution, uh, or, or uh, wh what is their place, in other words? What is... Okay. Well, I'm, I think I, s I see at least two or three questions involved. Right. Okay. One is, is science going that way? No, clearly is not. And probably people over there who are scientists would think largely like scientists do here. Uh, their, their religion may have some influence. But, but I don't, I don't know, I've never dealt with them, so I don't know. But um, another question is, how should we relate to them? How, how could we try to, bring, to them? bring the gospel to them? Mm -hmm. well, we can't make fun of what they believe. Right. We have to be friends with them, and then if at some point if they start asking questions, then we can try to explain. I had a graduate student who once who, who asked me, tell me what are the best arguments to use to win an argument over creation. And I told him, none. You're taking the wrong approach. You don't, you don't get anywhere by arguing with people. You need to become their friend. And if they re really become their friend, and then they start asking questions, then you can be ready to try to answer their questions. I wanted to just uh, let you know the, what was the purpose of my question, or I didn't even mm -hmm. form the right question, but the purpose was, they believe their, their religion is the oldest one. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why, but they believe that their religion is the oldest one. And since we came after, according to them, we are following their religion. Mm -hmm. That's, and uh, that is the biggest uh, problem we have right now. Not we, I mean, when you talk to them, that is the main hurdle. How to explain it to them that their religion is not the oldest one. Yeah, well, I, I don't deal with them, and so I don't really know how to answer your question about how to approach them. You have to ask somebody who's experienced with those groups. But uh, there is another, your question has another angle, which you may not be, the, it may not be the one you're asking, but other people are asking this. How, how does God deal with this? How does he decide who's going to be saved? And I know Protestants who say that everybody who lived before Jesus will burn in hell forever because they never heard the name of Jesus. Okay, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> I can't buy that. Um, 
I, I, I had a conversation one time out in, the, out in the desert in Arizona with a, with a friend, a geologist friend, who's an atheist. But he's, he's not an antagonistic atheist. We've had a lot of beautiful conversations with him asking questions and me trying to answer them. He asked me questions like, what is heaven? What is hell? And what is salvation? And I tried to explain to him how God decides who's going to be saved. And it can't be whether we have enough information. Uh, it can't be. I mean, people living, you know, many places. And I, I used, I started with an explanation that Ellen White gave. I didn't tell him where it came from. But she talks about a, a person uh, in darkest Africa who's never heard the name of Jesus, does not know about God. The Holy Spirit speaks to their heart. And they respond in ways that they can understand. They are kind to people, they're kind to the animals, and they'll end up in heaven and they'll wonder what happened. Okay, the Holy, and I tried to explain to this geologist, the Holy Spirit speaks to every one of us. And somehow we respond. We may not know what is the influence that we're responding to, but we're responding positively or negatively. And, and could there even be atheists who are atheists because they've been given a wrong understanding of what God is like and they can't buy it? And the Holy Spirit would speak to them, and they would respond in, in ways that they are, they are, they do have a relationship with God, even though they have no idea that that's what's happening. Uh, I think the way God deals with these things is something like that. He, he knows our background. In the Bible, it says, in some place, I don't know where, the pastor could probably tell you, uh, it says, God knows that this person came from Zion. This person came from somewhere else. He knows our context, he knows our experience, and what we have been able to understand. And he has a fair way uh, of responding to that. All right, anyone else? Okay, we've got one, one more right over here. Robert. Do you have any thoughts on the age of the matter on the planet, anything that might be maybe consistent with the Bible, but a little bit different than the typical number of years we hear? Yes. Um, actually, <coughs> the first few verses in Genesis, do they mean, do they tell us that God created the whole universe in our creation week? Or was there, or did God create the universe long ago? Who knows how many billions of years ago? And, it, and then, you know, it says there in Genesis 1, the earth was without form and void. It was empty. And then he prepared it for life. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, many of our Protestant friends believe that the earth, um, that the whole universe was created in our creation week. That's, that's referred to as young earth creationism. Uh, the whole universe. Um, some, some of us, especially I guess many of us Seventh-day Adventists, are more comfortable with the idea that he made the universe long ago, and then it came our turn to be, to be finished, and he came to this earth and prepared it and made life here, and that was our creation week. And this, we get that largely from our, our understanding of the great controversy. There were, there were people on other planets uh, before, and Satan sinned, and then, um, and then God created our earth, our, the people, the li life on this earth. And so those are two different points of view, and, and uh, you know, I've been in discussions with some of our theologians, and, and I don't think, and they don't seem to think there's reason that we should get uptight about which, uh, which one of those is right. I have graduate students who are Baptists who are convinced that the earth universe is only 6,000 years old. Well, I don't argue with them about it, um, even though I don't agree with them. I, I um, right, right here. What do you make of the progression of life forms in the geological column? Okay, so you got um, <coughs> you got invertebrates and fish at the very bottom, then you got amphibians and then reptiles and then birds and mammals. That's what you're referring to, and people are at the top. Well, that that is another thing we don't really have full answers for. We've never seen a global flood. We don't know what would happen. Um, but there are, there are good reasons for thinking that is not really 
a record of evolution. Uh, it doesn't explain where you got all these kinds. You, you don't, Darwin is bothered by the fact that the, the, all the evolutionary s sequences of intermediates that he should, his theory calls for are not found as fossils. This was a big worry for him. And he, in his book, he spent all his time on fossils. He spent explaining why the data don't fit his theory. And they still don't. The data still don't fit his theory. And so we can give some answers as to why, some suggestions why you would have that sequence. The lower part of the, f of the geologic record is marine. And so you wouldn't expect any monkeys there or any, you know, any, you wouldn't expect us to be there. And so there is, in a very general way, that is an explanation. It doesn't explain anywhere near everything. It's, it's just a beginning of an explanation. It doesn't seem to be just a sorting of different types of life forms that we know today. It seems to be a history of extinct life forms that we've never seen. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and I, and so the, those authors tend to say, well, then during this period of time, there was a completely different set of of life forms going on during that period of time than this time, and and they have different characteristics. Maybe maybe they're more, maybe they're more tropically oriented, or maybe they're more, I don't know. The the you don't see modern life forms mixed in with them. Well, in in general, that's true. And you, there's you know two two probable explanations here. One is, the ones at the bottom, were the ones that evolved first. The others didn't evolve until later. That's one explanation. The other one is, um, during the flood, you had a lot of habitats just were wiped out, and all the organisms killed. The lower, uh, the lower life zones, just didn't survive. Um, that's another explanation. And the ones, the ones that we have now are the ones that were m the most likely to um, to make it on the changed Earth afterwards. Um, and so there's, it's not just dinosaurs that went extinct. There's just a huge raft of types of creatures that went extinct. And I think probably because they, they were from ecologies, from environmental settings, that were destroyed at the flood and did not reestablish on the very different Earth we have now. Okay, one more, uh, one more question, and then uh, what we'll do is we'll wrap it up and um, have a closing prayer. If any of you want to talk to him uh, individually, I'm sure he might be available to do that. So, yes, Denny. At the flood, was it the first time um, Earth had rain? Was it the first time, or is there any evidence uh, we have found that before the flood, the 40 days and 40 nights, uh, mm -hmm. it wasn't uh, rain? Okay, mm -hmm. we, we, we have the Bible statements. I don't know of anything in the geologic record that could answer your question. So because the, the, the rocks apparently were from the flood. So we have no record of what, what was happening between creation and the flood. No scientific record. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again so much to uh, uh, Dr. Brand. Can we give him appreciation? <laughs> again, I think it's clear that uh, we don't have all the answers, uh, but it's good to talk. Good to have dialogue, and uh, <clears throat> as we've said so many times, and and uh, Dr. Brand reiterated, um, it's a it's a faith venture either way. Um, I just have to say that uh, um, at the end of the day, I find great uh, source of peace of mind uh, that I come uh, to with with my beliefs in a personal God, and a God who is interested in my life. So. Anyway, I hope this uh, uh, discussion has been uh, beneficial for you. And again, we, we want to thank so much uh, Dr. Brand for uh, coming and, and joining us today. Uh, let's uh, have a word of prayer as we dismiss, shall we? Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we had to um, explore uh, this fascinating topic. And uh, we personally believe that there will be questions that will be answered for us only in eternity. And we are longing for that opportunity to uh, know you face to face and to hear some explanations to our curiosity. Uh, 
But until then, Lord, keep us in your care. We thank you that uh, we, we uh, have come to trust you and know you to be a God who loves and cares for us. Bless us now as we leave this place in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you again for coming.